The following program is a UW-TV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection with Al Page. Our guests are renowned jazz pianist Dave Brubeck and Professor Bill Smith from the School of Music at the University of Washington. Dave, how do you keep your concentration while playing? Do you ever just want to get up and go to the bathroom? Mm -hmm. Concentration is the main thing. That, uh, when, when you finally get to the point where you're playing in, in public. But when you're there and playing, does your mind wander? Do you want to get up and go? No, you, you cannot wander because uh, everything is happening so fast and it's so crucial. And um, there, uh, there's so many reasons that people do what they do, that are artists or musicians or inventors or physicians. And it's usually to have concentration. How do you train yourself to have concentration? Well, there's a lot of shortcuts. Such as? Getting loaded. <laughs> and that's what you don't want to do. You want to make your mind work. Mm -hmm. And uh, the shortcuts will kill you. And mm -hmm. the training. My mother once studied with Dame Myra Hess, and they would rehearse mm -hmm. in an auditorium. And she would have people come and throw boxes, empty cardboard boxes, down the aisles. Because as a concert pianist, if you, if you start listening to somebody getting up from their seat, somebody leaving, somebody, the minute you have a thought outside of what you're doing, it's a distraction, you'll probably make a mistake. It's death. Concentration is... Mm -hmm absolutely important. I think maybe that's the reason why a lot of jazz musicians play with their eyes closed because then you're less apt to be distracted. But when somebody's playing solo, you watch Dave, you watch Bill, are you concentrating then? Yeah. But we're concentrating within our group. If, if I look out in the audience and see somebody who looks bored, gives some evidence of being bored, it ruins it. Or, you know, or if somebody gets yeah. up and walks mm -hmm. out or something, it's... It, uh, or a door slam. Yeah. So if our concentration is maintained amongst the group, it's not only your inner concentration, but also concentrating on how the four of us are interreacting. But do you ever look at that other person and say, boy, he doesn't have it tonight? Mm -hmm. you, you can never be negative uh, mm -hmm. and have the night go well. It, the, the whole thing has to be a very positive... Mm -hmm. If something's going wrong, you want to be the most positive in the, in the world at that moment. So the whole thing doesn't fall apart. Sure. You, mm -hmm. It's just like playing football or basketball or tennis. You, you see guys psych themselves up for everything, and we're doing the same thing. Do you have to like the people you're playing with to concentrate? Can you play well with somebody who you don't like? You can play great with people you hate and anger is a great motivator, but love is the strongest by far. When you two people met at Mills College, was it love at first sight? Probably not, I don't know. <laughs> it took yeah, a while. I remember hearing about Dave. Uh, he had been uh, going to Mills, studying with Darius Mio uh, the year before I came, and I was there for a summer session when Dave wasn't around. I remember there were rumors of this terrific pianist mm -hmm. Uh, who played these really weird chords and, and I said, well, gee, he can't be any better than this guy I've been playing with. Uh, one of our other classmates was sort of in the, the uh, Teddy Wilson tradition and it was very good. And so I was, I was really prepared for, for Dave and uh, so, boy, they're right, this guy is truly weird. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, what was your first reaction when you met Bill? I was really impressed with, with Bill because at such an early age, he had mastered mm -hmm. so, so much of the technique of clarinet, and both in classical and in jazz, which is rare for somebody to have that ability. Even, even uh, older established players didn't have as much mastery as Bill had when he was very young. So when you two first started playing, did the jobs just roll in? 
<laughs> no, rolled in and rolled out the same day. No, we were not uh, a very popular group. We, we uh, I remember we used to play Sundays at Chinese restaurants sometimes and uh, play dime the, dances. Play for the food. If we were lucky, if were lucky <laughs> you get something. Is it true that you once stole chickens because somebody wouldn't pay you off? We did, but they were cooked. <laughs> So it's all right. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? No. Oh. no, no. <laughs> Statue of Limitations is out, I'm sure. I, well, um, that's good. Um, they used to pay Bill and I with a check. Each one of us would get a check, and we'd have to go to the bar where the owner cashed the check, then made us give him back half of the money. Then he had proof that he'd paid us union scale. <laughs> And uh, we'd take the change. And one night when we were going out through the kitchen, <laughs> the leader of the band had two chickens that he'd taken out of the icebox. And the owner came in just then, and he gave one to Bill and one to me, and we had to put them in our coats and go out the back door. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been better if they weren't Cook's chickens, I think, at that point. <laughs> So what did you surmise from all of this? Do club managers really deserve the reputation some of them have? Most of them do, but there's a few great ones. And uh, those are the ones we, we know from coast to coast. In, in the old days, you remember the, the good clubs where the waitresses only serve drinks uh, after you'd finished a tune and things like that, and the piano was in tune, the cash register uh, didn't ring uh, in, in the middle of a soft solo. <laughs> all, all the things, and whether there was air in the club or just plain blue smoke. And whether you really got your check when you were supposed to for the <laughs> yeah. amount it was supposed to be. And, that was, and it's still the same. Yeah. <laughs> you still have to look out. You've made a lot of comments about audiences and clubs. What makes for a good audience? Soberness knowledge can you tell can you sense whether an audience is good or not oh yeah it doesn't take long how can you tell well oh you just have a lot of things working in in your mind when you play clubs night after night mm -hmm. and i remember telling an audience off one night and the club owner coming to me and saying don't ever do that again. If you go up on that stand, you've got to handle these people, and you can never tell them off. And uh, I learned to do it. But there's, there's some nights, the, the real big drinkers in the old days would always tip the uh, mater d' mm. and sit down front where they could be in the spotlight that was near the bandstand. Just where you didn't want them just where you didn't want them. And of course they were flashing money all night and they got what they wanted, but I would try to get rid of them all night because you couldn't concentrate. Mm -hmm. You've talked about concentration again. Let's switch to the subject of discipline. Do you have to have discipline in order to improvise? Oh, yeah. Let the professor tell you. <laughs> He teaches this <laughs> class. Well, I think any kind of uh, creative art is a balance between the discipline to learn your craft and your skill and the uh, inspiration to do something creative with the skills you've uh, mastered. And uh, if you don't have the necessary skill, then it doesn't matter how inspired you are, you can't realize the things that you, you want to. And, uh, uh, on the other hand, if what you're doing is just craft, then it's of no interest either. It's a matter of getting a balance between the two things. It's like the English language, that there's no guarantee you'll write good poetry if you've uh, mastered English. But on the other hand, if you're potentially a brilliant poet in terms of ideas, you've got to have the skill with words to be able to realize your visions. So you need technique for the foundation and then you build upon that. And then mm -hmm. you can let it go. Then you need to continue enriching your technique. I mean, right. you know, it's not just getting a, a few basic things, but it's a matter of continually uh, improving your, your skills. Dave in street language, what did he just say? 
I kept thinking that it's close to what Stravinsky said, not in street language. And I don't know if Stravinsky was correct, but he said you can't use your analytical and your creative mind at the same time. And, uh, but it's some weird balance of mm -hmm. that. And I think it's, you want the creative to dominate when you're improvising and the analytical to be more in domination if, if you were playing with an orchestra or something. Well, or to, be in, or to be in the background uh, so that you're not consciously thinking. Now, when you were learning jazz, you learned, listened to uh, Art Tatum, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. And you were analyzing, whether you called it that or not, you'd mm -hmm. listen and, you, and, and see the things he did and think, hey, I could do that. And, you know, you'd absorb mm -hmm. certain skills uh, into your unconscious so you wouldn't, you wouldn't think about it. When you, so, it got, so after a while, when you were playing, you'd have certain things that you'd learn from Art Tatum, certain skills mm -hmm. that just became part of your way of playing. And when you improvise, if you stop to think about the analytical thing, then it would crimp your style in terms mm -hmm. of creativity. But if it comes out naturally, it helps mm -hmm. you. How can you tell whether somebody's improvising well or improvising badly, since it's such an unstructured form? Well, it's like uh, if somebody is speaking. Uh, if, if what they're saying to you has some kind of logic and some kind of feeling that, uh, that makes sense, then you think, well, that's good. If, if, on the other hand, it just seems to be aimless meandering, you think, well, I hear him talking, but he isn't saying anything. <laughs> and an another thing is vocabulary, when you said about speaking. What do you mean by vocabulary? Well, what if the guy were so brilliant in what he's talking about that you didn't understand it? Mm -hmm. So uh, that what he was saying really made sense to him and was a something in the future mm -hmm. that you're not up there yet. Mm -hmm. you, you could think the guy doesn't know what he's talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Reread him 20 years later That's and true. enough has That's happened. True. So uh, w how you judge what's going on, what the improviser should do is like Bill's conversation. You do say hello. You do talk about the weather. But if the guy blurts out the most deep thing in his mind, the first thing, and doesn't say hello, he, he may lose you, or you may think he's nuts. And the deep thing might be deep, but he's got to go through some transitions to get to that point. A performer has to do that. Let the, know, the audience know that there's certain things that we're going to build on tonight certain rudiments that we're all familiar with. We are going to say hello in, in a language we understand. Then we'll try and take you along where you may not have been yet. When you say hello in your music, you seem to express it with joy and happiness. Is that because it's jazz, or is it because it's you two playing jazz? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, jazz can be a language of protest and anger, as I said earlier. It can be anything the person mm -hmm. is feeling. And if you feel that way, I felt that way after World War II, and my music was very angry and full of protest. When Bill first heard me, it was probably my wildest period. So it's what's going on in your life. Mm -hmm. Again, it's like time. conversation, I think. You can express happiness or you can express anger with the same mm -hmm vocabulary of words and I think jazz is, is a, voc a vocabulary that that we have in common and many audiences share this vocabulary you know understand as you two have grown over the years has that maturity been reflected in your music uh, could I say you're a more mature piano player now Boy, you know that depends on the night and the audience and the piano you have your immature nights you have nights where you better be immature and be playing uh, at a different level. The piano might not take maturity that night. It might be a, just a terrible instrument, but it, it will allow you to reflect on uh, 
the old instruments where you used to put copper on the strings and get a, a real honky-tonk sound. Now, you might have a, a good piano that they've let go to pieces, and it sounds like an old copper <coughs> hammered piano. Now, what are you going to do, go home? No, you learn to work with it. And it might be a night where you play funny, stride, old-time, ragtime approach. Isn't this attitude you're expressing, though, mature? You know, I mean, yeah. when you were 20, you would have said, hey, I'm not going to play on this piano. Mm -hmm. I think it's mature to say, well, this, this piano has a lot of faults, but I think I can do something with it. I mean, yeah. I think maybe that's... That, isn't maturity partly having been through enough things so that you have various choices and can go with them and that you're not I think if you're immature you think well it's got to be this way this is the only way it can be and instead if you have a broader viewpoint mm -hmm. then you can even accept bad pianos. 20 years from now you two still going to be playing together? Sure. <laughs> we might we may be up there <laughs> in the, the great harp ensemble upstairs <laughs> great at that point let's end the conversation and let's hear some playing thank you very much
To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.